Welcome to the program on Egyptian Maze. I'm Gunnar Thompson. I will be your host and your guide as we follow a track of clues all across the world trying to solve the mystery of Egyptian Maze. But first, I'd like to start with a little humor. At the first Atlantic Conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia last year, there was a joke going around uh, about Prince Henry Sinclair. Uh, Prince Henry Sinclair was the Earl of the Orkneys, which are located north of uh, the British Isles. Well, one day, Prince Henry Sinclair, and this was back in the 14th century, he, he said to his followers, let's make a little bit of money by establishing a colony across the seas, and in order to do that, they had to find new lands. So Prince Henry bought a ship, and he loaded it up with cargo and hired a crew, and they set off across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, they hadn't gone very far before the lookout called down from the crow's nest, and he said, Your Lordship, there is trouble on the horizon! And Prince Henry shouted back up, Well, what is the trouble? And the lookout shouted back down, There's ships and sails! There's three of them! And Prince Henry shouted back, Can you identify any of those ships? And the lookout shouted back, Yes, the first one's the Pinta, the second one's the Nina, and the third one's the Santa Maria. And his lordship shouted back up, Can you identify any flags on those ships? And the lookout shouted back down, Yes, they're all flying the flag of Spain. And at that moment, the lieutenant rushed up to Prince Henry and declared, Oh my goodness, we're in trouble. There's a race to find new lands. Prince Henry very solemnly put his hand on his lieutenant's shoulder and said, Donna ye worry me lad. Those ships aren't looking for new lands. They're heading for China. Well, of course, Columbus was lost. He thought he was going to China, and that's because the wrong name for the land across the sea was on the map that he had. Yes, Columbus had a map. But even so, he was lost. And that brings up the issue of the person who holds the record for being lost. That was an individual by the name of Moses. Well, the Bible says that Moses wandered about in the Sinai Desert for 40 years. Uh, the big problem was that the tribes of Israel were also following around behind Moses. And that means everybody was lost for about 40 years. Well, the Sinai Desert just is not all that big. If you've got a good supply of water and a decent camel, you should be able to cross it in about a month. But they wandered around for 40 years. And some of my women friends tell me that that just goes to show, even back in biblical times, men didn't like to stop and ask directions. So Moses was lost. Columbus was lost. They were both fundamentalists. And they were following what they believed was what they should be doing. It was written down in stone, the laws. And Moses was looking for the promised land. Well, perhaps he was looking in the wrong place. Perhaps the promised land was, as many historians in the 18th century finally realized, the promised land was North and South America. This here is the Alberton de Verga map. It's a map that uh, I found back in 1995. I brought it out of hiding and I, I introduced it to the scientific community. Now, the important thing about this map, it, it was made by Alberton de Verga, who was a Venetian in 1414, and it's a secret commercial map, but it shows up here, this is north of the British Isles, here's the British Isles, Spain, Norway, Africa, Mediterranean, Italy. North of the British Isles, we have this orange or red continent, and it sticks out from Norway. Well, there were many names for this ancient continent. The Norwegians called it Norveka, or Dusky Norway, the Irish called it Hibernia Major, or Great Ireland, and the Scots called it Estoteland, or New Scotland. This is interesting to me right north and west of the British Isles, because in Europe during the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the merchants from across the seas, from this land area that appears on this map, they were bringing maize and turkeys across the ocean, across the Atlantic Ocean. And these were bring, being introduced into Northern Europe. Well, there's a number of names that the Northern Europeans had for maize. One was turkey corn, and that's because 
the corn was fed to turkeys. Another name was Welsh corn, and that's because merchants from Wales were bringing the corn across the Atlantic. And another term was Indian corn, and that's because many people thought that it was India that was located across the sea. So we find similar names for turkeys and corn, Indian corn, Welsh corn, turkey corn, turkeys, Welsh hens, and dindons, or Indian hens, and names for turkeys. Uh, and this is because the merchants were carrying these animals across the sea. And this is really intriguing to me because the mystery of Egyptian maize got its start in Scotland when a number of my colleagues, uh, time detectives, noticed that there were carvings of the maize plant, or Indian corn, inside Rosslyn Chapel. And Rosslyn Chapel is, no, is located right in the vicinity of Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2006, I got messages from two friends who urged me to see the evidence of corn in Rosslyn Chapel in Edinburgh. Here's an aerial view of the exterior of the chapel uh, from a tourist brochure. Here's the stone vault inside the chapel. The red arrow is on a corn cob that has been carved into a stone vault. The corn cob is identified by a conical shape and parallel rows of beads or kernels arranged along the surface. This is a comparison of the Mayan corn god with Rosslyn corn. In both cases, there are rows of corn beads on the leaves. This shows a similar treatment of the artistic design. During the 16th century, and probably much earlier, Germans called maize by the name of Welsh corn. According to Welsh legends, a prince by the name of Madoc established a colony in the New World during the 11th century. Probably Welsh merchants sailing between the colony and Europe brought back corn to northern European ports. And that seems like a plausible explanation for why the Germans referred to maize as Welsh corn. Here is an illustration of turkey corn from Fuchs Herbal of 1542. Early corn in Europe was called Indian corn or turkey corn. One reason it was called turkey corn is because it was imported to feed turkeys. Turkeys were New World farm birds that were known to the Romans and the Turks. Here is a wo woven image of a turkey farm in Sweden during the 10th century. This is from a tapestry in the Stockholm Museum. These are turkeys. They are New World birds. Here we have two turkeys on the Bayeux tapestry from France, and the tapestry was made in around the year 1070, or slightly after the Norman invasion of England. Once again, we have turkeys indicated, and the French often referred to the turkeys as dindons, or birds of India. This is a schematic representation of the Bayeux turkeys and a modern turkey. As you can see, they are pretty much the same. The food historian, Magalome Toussaint Somat, mentioned that turkeys were served at the 13th century banquet given for Philip of Burgundy. Here is a German turkey on a mural from the Schleswig Cathedral, circa 1280. One name for turkeys in Germany was the Welsh hen. So we have both names, Welsh corn and Welsh hen, arriving in Germany. This suggests that merchants from a Welsh colony in the New World were importing turkeys and turkey feed at the same time. It was a way for merchants to make money.